Starting our list off at number 10, microwave. I can't say microwave anymore. I have to say microwave because of this video. Milk, full fat, which I've warmed in the microwave. Thanks to this first invention on our list today, I can eat Hot Pockets anytime I want. Not all inventions allow you to accomplish such a feat. Percy Spencer changed the science and snack game. He was originally an American engineer working for Raytheon, but Percy also loved a snack on the site. So he had a chocolate bar in his pocket one day. He was saving it for later, but when he walked in front of a magnetron, the chocolate bar in his pocket, well, it sadly melted. But luckily for us, after a few follow-up experiments in 1945, we now get microwave ovens. And it's always a good time. It wasn't until 1967, mind you, where microwaves were in our actual homes, because of course it took a little while to narrow down. But yeah, nowadays it's great. We almost forget we have one now. It's perfect. Number nine. Super glue. I feel like we're using super glue now more than ever in history. Activists are gluing themselves to tables, streets, you name it. But who do we have to thank for such a sticky substance? Back in 1942, inventor Dr. Harry Coover was working on plastic sites for weapons. Now, this was intended to help Allied forces during World War II, but while working on these clear plastic sites, he made super glue instead. Now, obviously, he was a little busy at the time, so he shelved this invention for nine years before returning back to the lab. Super glue didn't completely come out until 1958. It took 16 years to get to our shelves, and it's still there. We use super glue to fix everything even the occasional social issue, it appears. Number eight, pacemaker. Here we go, this one's a tad more exciting than super glue, dare I say. A pacemaker, odds are you know somebody with one of these right now. It all started in 1956, when Wilson Greatbach was trying to record the rhythm of the heart. Not the song, the actual rhythm of the actual heart. That's the dumbest joke I've ever put in anything in my entire life. But after installing the wrong piece by mistake, he actually realized that the circuit was emitting these pulses, these heartbeat type pulses. So he thought, well, maybe I can create a device small enough for a body and actually stimulate an actual heartbeat. Cut to 1958, a dog was the first ever proud owner of one pacemaker. He's walking around, he's like, hey, life's rough. Number seven. Theory of evolution. Charles Darwin, we don't think of this man too often for obvious reasons, but he had some ideas that were out there, right? In his book, The Origin of Species, written back in 1859, he explained how humans were evolved from the animal kingdom. And as if that wasn't already a handful of news, he also claimed that the world was much, much older than what everybody thought. And around the 1930s, that crazy idea was then accepted into the scientific community officially. Imagine being the first person to be like, I think we came from animals. I don't think we're uh, aliens. I think we're actually, I think we're actually animals. That's a hot take, right? Number six, oxygen. Okay, speaking of hot takes, again, imagine being the first person to be like, what is this? What am I breathing right now? Why is this so good? What is oxygen? What is all this gas around us? Pretty hot take. That's a pretty bold thing to just dive into. Oxygen was identified for the first time scientifically by Joseph Priestley back in 1774. After he heated up red mercuric oxide, he found this colorless gas, and at first he called it deflogisticated air, which is, you know, it doesn't roll off the tongue per se. And Priestley shared his discovery with the French scientist Antoine Lavoisier. Lavoisier then connected these dots, and we learned that oxygen supports animal life. And us too, we don't mind air. Air's pretty, that's pretty nice. Number five, not flat. Let's talk about the earth for a hot second, shall we? Any guesses as to what shape it is? I'll tell you one thing, it's certainly not flat. Definitely not a flat planet. We can hit that thumbs up for not a flat earth. We've known this since 1619, when Johann Kepler published the third law of planetary motion. Now this, this was a glorious day for the scientific community. This is when humans finally figured out that the Earth revolves around the sun and not the other way around. And also circular. That's also a great point to learn at the same time that it's not flat, for sure not flat, definitely a circle. If you're a flat earther, hit that thumbs up. We're learning today, you know? Number four. Velcro. All right, shout out to every guy out there with a Velcro wallet. Keep doing it, man. I still have mine from high school. I'll never abandon that thing ever in my life. It's still got, it's still got some stick left in them. Who must we thank for Velcro? I use Velcro every day. I use them on my rock climbing shoes so I don't fall off the wall. And it's all thanks to a Swiss engineer named George de Mestral. And back in 1941, he found these burrs clinging to his pants and his dog's fur. He went for a walk and then he was covered in all those spiky balls. That's the worst day, eh? that happens so often. We've all been there, but we've certainly never been inspired like George was. 
The word Velcro is actually a combination of velvet and crochet. Now these are artificial hooks that stick on your clothes. They were heavily used by NASA first in the 1960s. And then for us, of course, when we weren't ready to tie our shoes. Number three, the discovery of penicillin. Sometimes miracles happen when nobody's even in the room, right? It's like boiling water or something like that. You have to look away. A watched pot never boils. It certainly does though, you know? Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin back in 1928. Now at the time, he was actually studying Staphylococcus, bacteria that causes infections and boils and nasty stuff. But right before Alexander left for a two week vacation, he left a Petri dish with some of that Staphylococcus just on the lab table rather than stored away in an incubator. Turns out everybody here needed alone time because during this off time, a penicillium mold spore just got the confidence to introduce itself to said bacteria. And now the, the room's temperature was also perfect. It was a lovely moment for everybody involved. Plus the emptiness of the room allowed for the mold to finally fight back in peace and prevent that bacteria from growing furthermore. He discovered this antibacterial substance was only produced by strains of penicillium. Guy's like, all right, see you in two weeks. Comes back to a literal miracle. It's like, what? Number two, the Trinity test. Not all of these are Velcro and fun and games, okay? Some science discoveries suck. When Americans heard that Germans were developing nuclear weapons, they joined in with their development on a project, most of it being done in New Mexico. So in 1939, President Roosevelt got scientists, military officials, this whole team of brilliant individuals to figure out how to use uranium as a weapon. The government eventually started to fund said research, which was happening at Columbia University. And in 1942, engineers from the army joined in as well. And following Pearl Harbor, that's when President Roosevelt transitioned the project into a military branch officially, the Manhattan Project, made with the strict goal of weaponizing nuclear energy. There are facilities in New Mexico, Tennessee, Washington, even here in Canada, you name it. But come July 16th, 1945, the Trinity test was conducted. The first atomic weapon was detonated in a New Mexico desert and it was deemed a success with mushroom clouds reaching as high as 40,000 feet. It was, uh, yeah, that was definitely life-changing, for sure. And finally, number one, Coca-Cola. All right, we'll finish on a nice sweet note. Let's do it. Every time it's the holiday season, I see nothing but Coca-Cola ads. I don't know how they do it. They've somehow tapped into the entire holiday season. But how does such a syrup come to be in the first place? We'll end on this one so we can all grab a drink immediately after the video ends. I got you, I know how to do this. Inventor and pharmacist John Pemberton originally set out to cure headaches, which is pretty ironic. Two main ingredients, of course, being coca leaves and cola nuts. Now, things were boring, dare I say, until his lab assistant accidentally mixed the two with carbonated water. And then, poof, it's a miracle. It's like they knew, it's like they were from the future and they're like, hey, Trust me, I got us. Over time, you throw in this top secret recipe, which we still don't know, and now we have a movie theater essential. And one of my favorite soft drinks, Coca-Cola. Personally, actually, I'm lying. I'm a Dr. Pepper guy, if anything. 23 flavors? How in the world do they get it in that little can? If we get a part two, I'll throw Dr. Pepper in. There you go. Number 10, the plague. Life was okay back in the Middle Ages. The sun was shining. There was a castle that overlooked the serfs as they worked day and night to provide for the community. Children frolicked in the meadows and the smell of fresh baked bread fills the air as both the flour mill and the ladies kneading dough are hard at work. Sounds too good to be true. New faces from other lands have brought trinkets in trade, and that's awesome, but they have also brought something else. Something that's not visible to the naked eye. Shortly after, people in the village become violently ill. The smell of bread has been replaced by burning bodies. This, ladies and gentlemen, was the discovery of the plague. The bubonic plague took the world by storm. Millions perished in a horrible and disgusting sickness. It almost got all of us too. Seriously, the percentage is actually kind of crazy. And because of roaming traders, like from the Silk Road, meeting east and west, a lack of medical knowledge and hygiene, well, it spread like wildfire. Number nine, poisonous berries. This might sound ridiculous, but at some point, someone had to test out this stuff or, well, find out by accident. Early humans relied on hunting, scavenging, and harvesting before we had mastered agriculture. Hunting is difficult, especially if you're burning more calories than it's worth. Man, hunting those big animals, I don't know. Foraging is a great alternative, but once the supply runs out, well, it's time to move, and that's pretty much what we did. However, the biggest issue is knowing what's good to eat, not what's the tastiest. But what's safe to eat? I mean, take blueberries and nightshade, for example. Blueberries are a delicious summer treat that also make for a great pie. 
and well, you'd probably find lots of them. Nightshade looks identical to blueberries, except they contain dangerous amounts of alkaloids and other compounds that even if a small handful are eaten, it could prove to be fatal. And they look exactly alike and can be found in droves. So be careful, folks. If it grows on a wood, this is good. If it grows on a tree, this pea, don't eat it. That's a rhyme that I made just now. I'm top of my head. There you go. That's, I don't know. <laughs> Number eight, Sleeping Giant. December 7th, 1941, the Empire of Japan attacked the Naval Pearl Harbor base in America in hopes of persuading America to let go of their oil embargo and not join the war effort. Well, the opposite happened. Not only did America join the effort, but went into overdrive. Japan, as they called it, had woken the Sleeping Giant. America put its factories into overdrive and turbo mode and with allies right behind them punched their way through Europe. However, the Pacific was their time for revenge. And on those faithful days in August of 1945, Japan realized probably the most darkest discovery ever. America would wipe out two of their cities with something that they could quite possibly end the entire world with. It doesn't get much darker than that. Ending the whole world and that's end worlders. End world, world enders, that's it. World enders, there we go. I can talk today, I'll be all right. Number seven, the Titanic. The Titanic is just one of those things that people love. Like Canadian sweetheart Ryan Reynolds or the Rocky Horror Picture Show. For some reason, people just like those things. I get Ryan Reynolds, I'm not a big fan of the, the movie though. Rocky Horror Picture Show, I'm not, not a big fan. Even before the movie, there was some fascination with this cruise liner. Otherwise, it might not have been found. However, take off your nostalgia glasses for a second if you will. When the Titanic was found on the ocean floor September 1st, 1985, she was as she sank, meaning all the unfortunate souls aboard that went down with the ship were likely still there, or, well, what was left of them. Clothes, shoes, and trinkets of all those who perished at sea. It does make for a great story, yes, it absolutely does, but this Folks, is a horrific tragedy, and I can only imagine the eeriness of being down there without any lights on. The horror. Oh, God. And it's freezing cold water, too. You, you had no chance, dude. Awful. Number six, Sokka. Mother Russia. She is massive and vast, isn't she? <laughs> Just like First Wife. Anyway. <laughs> Today, however, I'd like to focus on the Sokka region of Russia, which is a large area in the east. What makes this area so unique? Well, it's because it's barely been explored. We're talking thousands of kilometers here, not just a few. While there are humans who live there, it's kind of like Canada, actually. Well, we only live in small pockets close to other civilizations. We're on the border, pretty much. That's because this part of Russia is covered in permafrost. Even the major city in the area is built upon this. The rest is, well, snowy, forest, wildlife, and... Well, get your highlighters out because it's cold, very cold, with temperatures reaching below 50 degrees Celsius. 50 minus 50? What? That's insane. Can you just imagine what's hiding out there? We just don't know. That's insanity. Minus 50. Oh, dude, come on. That's too cold even for me. I'm Canadian. Number five, chlorine gas. World War I was a very strange time to be alive. Tanks, airplanes, cars, the industrial age was over and the modern age had come, sort of. Still no sliced bread yet though. It was a mix of old and new technology. Isn't that weird to think about? They had no sliced bread, they got airplanes? That's just weird. What am I getting at with this? Well, that would be chlorine gas. Trust me, it all makes sense, folks. A tactic that was many, many, many years ahead of its time. So you can imagine the horrible awfulness of encountering that for the first time. A thick greenish or yellowish smoke would slowly crawl across the battlefield and into soldiers' lungs where it suffocated and burned flesh. It was awful, and the first time it happened, there was nothing to protect against it. To those experiencing this for the first time, it would have been a very dark discovery in one of humanity's lowest points. It really was. Not a good time. Number four, tribals. Skyscrapers, trucks, excavators, the internet, hospitals, overpriced coffee, and waiting in line at the airport. All these things make for our modern society. But what if I told you that in deep and secluded areas of this earth, this planet that you live on, the same one, there are humans just like you or I who live like it's year one. Yes, that's right. To this day, in 2022, there still exist tribal peoples that have not been contacted and or live 
well, pretty much in the Stone Age. Surprisingly, you can find them all over the Earth. South America happens to be a very popular spot. While in the past some contact has been made, it is best to leave well enough alone, especially considering that some can be quite violent. Take the Sentinelese for example, a tribal group that lives not too far from the coast of India. When an attempt to contact this tribe, it often ends with spears and arrows. And many who have come to contact them, well, they didn't make it, they perished. Number 3 Diglock After World War II had ended, the metaphorical curtains were being drawn back and the Allies got a front row seat into what Germany had been up to. It wasn't a pretty sight, it was actually pretty heinous. But we all know about the camps and what they did, it was bad, it was really bad and I'm not really allowed to talk about it. But however, what you may not know is about their super secret Wunderwaffe programs which include the Diglock. Now this seems science fiction, but yeah, there were all kinds of weird and freaky experiments going on. A lot I can't talk about. One such experiment was the Diglock. It was being described as a bell shaped device that was claimed to create an anti-gravity field. That's just, that's just crazy. Okay. If this sounds bonkers, that's because it is. And a lot of this weird German science became the basis and foundation for the hidden story in the hit classic video game, Call of Duty Zombies. Isn't that so weird? That's, that shouldn't be real. That's, ah, man, that's weird. Like Dr. Richtofen's real, you know what I mean? Number two, the Marianas Trench. Doesn't get much darker than the Marianas Trench. Literally, I mean, maybe besides Adam's underwear. They were white when he bought them, I don't know. The famous Marianas Trench is the deepest point in the ocean, resting at a steep 10,000 meters, or 36,000 feet in American. Expeditions have been made to see what we could find, and to many surprise, there's actually life that far down, who would have thought? The strangest of all sea creatures to be sure. The question is however, it's not what we've seen, but we have not. There's still lots to be found down there, but hard to get down there, a lot of pressure. Number one, space. This one is kind of general, but bear with me. For the longest time, we thought Earth was the center of the universe, and who can blame us? Sometimes we're awesome. <laughs> Talking to you MTV generation, we're the best, right? Yeah! But through many great efforts over the last 100 years, it's clear that Earth is but a cog in the cosmic machine. While we don't know much about what's out there, we do know enough. We know that we are a planet, a part of a solar system, like the millions of others that make up this galaxy and the millions of galaxies that are out there. We are so tiny in a massive universe, and while the debate for other life forms is valid, it's quite possible we could be all alone. It could be just us in an infinite universe. That's scary. That's a dark discovery. That's, can you imagine how, like, how many millions and millions of kilometers away things are, and we're the only people? Yo, that's crazy. Oh. Number 10, T-Rex arms. All right, mystery solved, folks. Have you ever wondered why a T-Rex, one of the biggest, baddest dinosaurs in the game, have you ever wondered why their arms are so tiny? What went wrong here? How did they get the short end of the DNA dino stick? Well, scientists may have an answer. They've spent decade after decade debating T-Rex arms, which first of all, it's a great job. And now, at first, previous hypotheses suggested that their arms may have been used as pectoral claspers during mating, or to get off the ground after falling over, both hilarious in a sense. But even so, there's other parts of the body that would have been used in that scenario. So it's almost like they're still useless. New studies this year suggest that these arms getting smaller was actually perfect. The arms of the T-Rex shriveled because there is an evolutionary advantage to keeping them out of the way. T-Rex, yeah, they would eat in groups. So more often than not, these idiots would bite their friend's arms off or their own. Yeah, so they shriveled them up, kept them out of the way. Bob's your uncle. You ever bite your own finger while you're eating food? That's a personal embarrassing moment. Number nine, Garfield phones. Okay, hello, look who's calling. The Garfield crave began back in 1978. Jim Davis brought to life this lasagna-loving, Monday-hating cats, the OG grumpy cat, really. And as his popularity grew, of course, so did his merch. A Garfield couch with eyes, that's really anybody wants, right, in life? But the last thing you would expect to find floating in the ocean are probably Garfield phones. Also, yes, I said phones, not one phone. Thousands of Garfield phones have been slowly washing up ashore in France for 30 years now. Imagine standing there, looking at the ocean, thinking about your ex, pondering life, and then a Garfield phone washes up. You're like, ugh, fine, I'll call her. This began in the 80s, but until recently, we didn't know where they were coming from, which is pretty jarring. A farmer read about these phones in an article and how they could, you know, be hurting the environment, and he came forward and admitted he knew about the shipping container 
full of Garfield phones. Brene Morvan, this guy has been sitting on a national treasure, this huge secret. He says in the 80s he found the shipping container in a sea cave, which, I mean, imagine thinking you found some sort of lost billions worth of treasures, but it's just this sh If the ocean gives you plastic phones, you answer it. Number eight, holes. If you have trypophobia, you may want to skip this one, I'm not gonna lie, it's pretty, it's pretty odd. Off the coast of Big Sur, California, a survey revealed about 15,000 holes, all underwater, just on the ocean floor. For some reason, they're all the same size and they all measure up to be around 11 meters wide and one meter deep. Now the team at Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, they found 15,000 of these and they found 5,000 more that are even larger. They're called micro depressions and the big ones are called pockmarks. Initially, scientists thought that methane under the seafloor, it was just coming out to say hello. Maybe that's the reason for these indents. And then they, of course, left a crater. Rovers went down there, tests were done. Turns out that's not the case. No methane is involved. In fact, there hasn't been any methane down there for 50,000 years. These MDs are essentially garbage trails and now there's deep sea creatures living in them. It's like a little underwater neighborhood, it's cute. They even found a whale skull just laying in one of them. Can you imagine that? Imagine being a crab and coming home to that, I'd move. I'd move to the next micro depression immediately. Number seven, Amelia Earhart remains. The first woman to fly across the Atlantic was well on her way to setting even more groundbreaking records, but her plane tragically disappeared over the Pacific in 1937. And it's since been a great mystery where the final resting place of Amelia Earhart now is. But we may have actually found her remains back in 1940 without really knowing. They were found on the Pacific island of Nakumaroro. Now the initial examination of these remains were reported to be that of a man. That was the general idea in 1941. Come 2018, however, now we have a different idea. Could it be? Researcher Richard Johns took another look at the long lost remains and since those days, we've learned more about Amelia Earhart. Photos have since surfaced online. So we compared the bone measurements to her body type and they're pretty sure that they found our missing aviator. Number six, abandoned whiskey. This one's pretty fun, dare I say, a little exciting? I don't know. An explorer found crates in a hut belonging to another explorer, that of Ernest Shackleton. You've probably heard of him before, it's pretty huge. Anything belonging to our boy Ernest Shackleton is a treasure, especially when it's frozen bottles of scotch. That's pretty lovely. It's probably the best case scenario, really, evidently. It's 2010 and you find 100 year old frozen scotch that Ernest Shackleton once drank. What do you do? Do you drink it? Do you save it? A little bit of both. I would do a bit of both. This may be the best discovery on this list, or at least the happiest. It's been locked up, of course, since, you know, such a historical find, but you'll be happy to know that a sample was given to Scottish distiller White and McKay. They're now studying this recipe to try and bring it back to life, which is amazing. Number five, surprise Nikes. I threw shoes on my holiday wish list this year, and every year for that matter. Nothing like a nice fresh pair of sneaks. Sometimes you find the perfect shoes and sometimes they find you. In the mid 90s, a shipment of Nike shoes heading to the US was lost during this crazy storm. Around five shipping containers fell into the sea. So later on, 61,000 pairs of shoes just started to drift towards the West Coast. Just all mar just making their little way, just slowly but surely. That's terrifying. People saw shoes in the water. Do you know how afraid I would be if a shoe brushed against my shoulder while I was swimming? My brain would go to the darkest places. So scary. These shoes luckily didn't belong to anybody, but they did all have the same serial number by chance. So what started as this ocean mystery ended up working out for the better. Nike lost a lot of money and we tracked the shoes journey. So now we oddly learned more about our ocean currents. Well, Nike lost money. Win win. Number four, 2021 rocket. Remember last year in May when a large piece of space junk was just gonna crash land somewhere on Earth and we had no idea where it was gonna hit? Possible Avengers level threat. We're all just looking at Twitter, refreshing, like, mm, where's it gonna be? Where did it land? Well, at the time, this was one of the biggest pieces of human made space junk to ever crash towards Earth, so it was a little jarring. They said it would land in New York or New Zealand. One of the two, okay, gamble, let's do it, 50-50. The debris came from the lost March 5B rocket and landed in the Indian Ocean, luckily, with most of it burning up upon re-entry. Now, usually when rockets discard pieces, it's done so strategically, falling into the ocean, normally the Atlantic, in a graveyard, this was not supposed to happen. Thankfully, it didn't land in New York. That, again, would have been terrifying. It would look like Loki's arrived. What's, what's that, is that a meteor, are we done? Number three. Raining spiders. Back in 2015, and you guessed it, Australia, residents of Goulburn woke up to the town just being caked in spiders. This is my nightmare. This is, I think, 
Yeah, this is my absolute biggest fear. Everything was webbed. They were tiny black spiderlings all over the place. Resident Ian Watson told reporters that, quote, when I looked up at the sun, it was like this tunnel of webs going up for a couple of hundred meters into the sky. End quote. Also, delete memory. Thanks. Rick Vetter, an entomologist at the University of California at Riverside, says that many spiders are just ballooning around us, but thankfully, they all don't do it at the same time, like this situation. Yeah, this is happening all the time, so keep your heads up or down. I'd rather not look. Number two, giant pipes. Back in 2017, these massive industrial pipes washed up along the shores of the northern Norfolk coast. Now, if I was swimming and I saw this thing floating towards me, I would faint. I would think it's a giant sea snake or something. I would have no idea what I was looking at. These things were massive. Terrible discovery, but again, pretty exciting. I didn't realize how big these were at first, and then I zoomed in. I think I have some mechanophobia now. Where did they come from? Well, these pipes were lost at sea following an accident on an Iceland shipping container, which resulted in 500 meter long pipes coming loose. Yeah, that's so scary. Luckily, you can see these things coming, but that's still jarring. I would think it's a submarine emerging out of the water, God. The company that produced them, Pipe Life, Great name, rather fitting. They urge the curious to stay far away. Do not approach them. You can see them coming because they're the size of buildings, so they can obviously easily crush a human being. These ocean pipes have a diameter of two meters, and the longest one that washed up on the beach was 500 meters long. Number one, three kittens. Back in 2020, an oil worker named Drayton Dewich found three kittens all frozen to the ground near Drayton Valley. They were alive, but just, you know, very cold. It was mid-January, everything is frozen. This was near an oil well that he'd been working on, right? Those are always freezing cold. On Facebook, they posted about how the three kittens were all males, dewormed and living under the same roof now, and they were much warmer. He just found three little pets and brought them home. He got them out of the ice by using coffee to melt the ice. That's amazing. I said it once before and I'll say it again, coffee saves lives. He was like, oh yeah, look at that. They're alive. Number 10, Serpent Mound. The Great Serpent Mound is a 1,400 foot long, three foot high prehistoric effigy located in Peebles, Ohio, United States. Serpent Mound was first reported via surveyors Ephraim Squire and Edwin Davis and was featured in their Ancient Monuments of Mississippi book back in 1848. Looks just like a regular golf course, doesn't it? But underneath, it's perfectly placed and well preserved earth formations that were made by hand to align with something in the sky. The mound is the largest serpent effigy in the world. Yeah, big snake. The mound itself winds back and forth for more than 800 feet with its tail coiling in seven different areas. Tons of Clovis era spearheads have been found that indicate interaction with other groups of ancient humans along with the Denisovans and the Neanderthals. Archaeologists believe that the mound's creation was influenced by two astronomical events. The light from the supernova Crab Nebula in 1054 and Halley's Comet in 1066. The mound is also located on an ancient meteorite impact location which makes things absolutely way scarier. In 2003, geologists from Ohio State University and Glasgow said the meteorite impact origin of the structure at Serpent Mound is the best evidence for its build and importance. Yeah, nothing crazy, just a mile long, cosmically aligned serpent made out of rocks, made from prehistoric dudes who could barely work fire right on top of a huge impact location. Yeah. Something's fishy here. Number nine, the Terracotta Army. Hey, if you dig what we do here on Bumblebee, make sure you hit us up with a like button or comment down below which discovery in ancient history has you laying awake at night. I know mine. Let me know, I'll check it out. The Terracotta Army, don't even get me started, was first discovered in 1974 by a group of farmers east of the Queen Emperor's Tomb Mound at Mount Lee. For centuries, reports mentioned pieces of the terracotta fragments found, roofing tiles, bits of brick, masonry, but when they discovered heads of clay bodies, yeah, the Chinese archeologists started to investigate and dig a little bit deeper. To this day, it remains the largest pottery group ever found on Earth. The Terracotta Army is a collection of sculptures depicting depicting the armies of the Qin Shi Huang, the first emperor of China. Apparently a form of funerary art buried with the emperor around 209 BCE with the purpose of protecting him in the afterlife. 8,000 soldiers, 130 chariots, 520 horses, and 150 cavalry. Yeah. That's a lot of protection. The site is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site and has been since 1987. I'm just getting Medusa vibes when I look at this, you know? Like, I'm not convinced the actual purpose of this operation. Like, was it a front? Were they once alive? Who knows, dude? This place is mysterious. 
but cool. Number eight, the Antikythera mechanism. The Antikythera mechanism is an anomaly ancient computer that uses the cosmos to predict astronomical events. A group of sea sponge divers discovered the Antikythera shipwreck in early 1900 just off the island in Greece. Hence, the name. I find it funny that divers diving for something you wipe your butt with found an ancient computer just chilling down there. Something about that makes me laugh. Many think it's cursed too due to its first handlings. Apparently after its discovery, three of the divers who dove down died shortly after its find. 150 feet deep just off Point Glyphadia, the team retrieved millions in worth of bronze, marble, pottery, glassware, jewelry, coins, and of course, this ancient MacBook. This device is made entirely out of a single bronze sheet built within a wooden case about the size of a shoebox. Faces and cogs covered in Greek inscriptions indicating the device's astronomical calendar, purpose, use, basically everything we have on our iPhone right now within this wooden box 2,200 years ago. Yeah, again, collecting sea sponges to wipe our butts with and then just stumbling upon a computer. I don't know. Someone's getting a raise. I'll say that. Number seven, the Codex Gigas. Basically translates to giant book. Codex Gigas. And it's giant. 170 pounds. It's the largest medieval manuscript in the world. Also known as the Devil's Bible. Yeah, due to the highly detailed full page portrait of Satan himself, the demonology written within, and the legend around its initial creation. Made out of 180 donkeys, the famous myth is that the scribe traded his soul to the Prince of Darkness so that he could complete and master the contents of the universe written within this one book, comprised in only one night. Created in the early 13th century in the Benedictine Monastery of Bohemia, now modern day Czech Republic, this book's creepy. Yeah, it contains the complete Bible, like the Old One and the New Testament, as well as everything medicinal and cosmological that a human would know at Earth at that time. All written in Latin, and of course predated glyphs, and of course missing the last 10 pages of the book. Yep, ripped out and missing. I don't know. Who knows? The book lays in the National Library of Sweden in Stockholm. I wouldn't go near it. I wouldn't read it. I wouldn't even touch it. You know, I'm good with goosebumps. That scares me enough. Number six, the oldest map. A 4,000 year old stone slab first discovered over a century ago in France may be the oldest known map in Europe, according to a new study. The slab dates back to the early Bronze Age, 4,000 years ago. It was first discovered in 1900 in a prehistoric burial site in Finisterre, France. The engravings on the broken stone appear to resemble topographic features including hills, reference points, and river networks. The broken slab, which is four meters long, was moved to a private museum in France in 1924. It was then stored in a French castle where it gathered dust until it was rediscovered in the castle cellar in 2014. But only recently are researchers beginning to understand the actual importance behind this prehistoric slab rock. It's been interpreted as the oldest cartographical map in Europe. Yeah, that's old. Number five, the Voynich Manuscript. There's a giant Italian Renaissance folio called the Voynich manuscript. It's named after Wilfred Voynich, a book dealer who purchased it in 1912, and to this day, we don't really know what it is. Hands down, the most mysterious book of all time. Not only is it detailed so carefully and patiently, it's basically like a Tim Burton take on a book about life, with an entire world drawn and recorded that isn't ours. Like, parallel universe type stuff. Even the language is unknown. Like, unknown unknown. Like, predates Latin and doesn't use phonetic patterns and coding. The riddle of all riddles. Written somewhere between 14 1405 and 1450, all 240 pages are inscribed in some sort of indecipherable language of about 170,000 characters. Historians and cartographers have tried to crack the code for hundreds of years, yet not one has been successful. Why wasn't this a national treasure movie? I feel like this would have been perfect, like Nicolas Cage, you know? I don't know. Number four, the Nazca Lines. The ancient, very mysterious geoglyphs that make up the soil of the Nazca Desert in southern Peru is an old one. They were created, we think, somewhere between 1000 BCE and 500 AD. Basically, people would make impressions or shallow incisions on the desert floor, removing pebbles, leaving colored dirt exposed, drawing some sort of depictions of fauna and humanoid scribbles for only those above Earth to visually See. Basically what I'm trying to say here is that these are giant ancient unknown drawings you can only accurately depict from space or from like drones hundreds of miles in the air. In the years leading up to 2020, between 80 and 100 new figures have been found with the use of drones and cameras since at least year 1900. Yo, who's drawing these things? And why is the mountain range just so perfectly square and flat like it's been laser cut to draw on? More than 70 designs are zoomorphic, including birds, spiders, fish, lizards, and of course, humans. Lots of different shapes and clothing and builds of 
humans. Interesting. It became a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1994. Yeah, I'd like to think so. I feel like this is going to be on Art Attack. Number three, the mother of dragons. Mary Anning was an English fossil collector, dealer, and paleontologist who became famously known around the world for her discoveries in Jurassic marine fossil beds in the cliffs along the English Channel at Lyme Regis in southwest England. I'm not talking about finding a tooth or something. She found three species of dinosaurs. Like three different species of dinosaur. Anning's findings contributed to a massive scientific research pushing prehistoric academia towards the future. In 1811, when Mary was only 12, she found a bizarre fossilized skull. Mary then searched for and dug the outline of its 5.2 meter long skeleton, and by the time she was done, everyone in the town knew that she had discovered something important. Scientists thought this was some sort of ancient crocodile. People were puzzled. Ten years later, she discovers a completely new skeleton of plesiosaur. Two years later, she found one with wings. Today, the Natural History Museum in London showcases several of Mary Anning's historic finds, including her ichthyosaurus, plesiosaur, and pterosaur. Dude, there needs to be like at least three movies about her on Netflix, no? Like Jurassic Park, England. Number two, Gobekli Tepe. This mysterious ancient site in the southeastern Anatolia region of Turkey is dated between 1000 and 12,000 BCE. The site comprises of a number of large man made structures supported by massive stone megalithic pillars. Gobekli Tepe, or known simply as Potbelly Hill, is the oldest place of which megaliths were mounted. The oldest like ever, and most confusing. Pillars richly decorated with promorphic details, clothing, wild animals, fauna, star systems. Archaeologists are puzzled, to say the least. Famous German archaeologist Klaus Schmidt views Gobekli Tepe as a Stone Age sanctuary. Radiocarbon dating indicates that it contains the oldest known ruins that holster butchered bones of not only deer, but pigs, birds, geese, fish. They've been identified as cooked food, prepared for large groups as festivals or feasts. Yeah, they don't really know exactly what this place was used for, but after finding all this academia and scientific knowledge, it's certain that this place was used by scholars of high order to either teach or study the skills of masonry, as well as the cosmos. And it's only been about a tenth discovered so far. Yeah, just about one tenth. Who knows what other secrets Gobekli Tepe has to unveil? Let's get those other nine tenths uh, undug, no? And the number one spot, ancient Greek shipwreck. The oldest ancient Greek shipwreck ever discovered in the Black Sea, and you would never guess by looking at it. This ship is from 400 BC. It's an ancient Greek trading vessel. Not huge, but somehow, this ship has been kept in almost perfect condition for over 2,400 years, a mile below the sea surface. The lack of oxygen actually preserved the ship, and that's why it looked like it sank last year, not thousands of years. Ago. John Adams, principal investigator with the Black Sea Archaeology Project, describes the finding as something he never thought was even possible, let alone something he'd witnessed with his own eyes in his lifetime. This discovery changed what we know about ships in the ancient world. It is to date the oldest intact shipwreck ever known to mankind. It can't be beat. This thing is older than most curses. I say pull it up, slap some paint on her, get her going again, no? Quality versus quantity back then? Things were just built to last back then. History.